Hi, this is Matt Baker. Welcome to Episode 3 in my series on Who Wrote the Bible. Today, I'll be finishing up the Jewish Tanakh, known to Christians as the Old Testament. In Episode 1, we looked at the Torah, or Pentateuch. And in Episode 2, we looked at the Nevi'im, or Prophets. Well, in this episode, we'll be looking at the third section of the Jewish Tanakh, the Ketavim, or Writings. This section includes Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So let's start with the book of Psalms, which is unique in that it's the only book in the Bible that consists entirely of words that were meant to be sung. Some of the Psalms are what we would today call hymns, whereas others are closer to prayers or poems. But in each case, they would have originally had music to go along with them. Music that, unfortunately, has been lost to time. But one thing that has not been lost, in most cases, is the name of the author of each psalm, or at least the person to whom the psalm is associated with. According to the text itself, 73 are attributed to King David, 12 to someone named Asaph, 11 to the sons of Korah, 2 to Solomon, 1 to Moses, 1 to Ethan the Ezraite, and 1 to Haman the Ezraite. 49 are anonymous, for a total of 150. Another thing that the text makes clear is that the Book of Psalms can actually be divided into five smaller books. This offers us further clues into who wrote each psalm and when. For example, the majority of the psalms attributed to King David are found in Book 1. This book may therefore represent the oldest part of the collection. However, keep in mind that just because a psalm starts with the phrase, of David, it might not mean that David himself wrote it. The phrase might also mean, for David, which is the reading that most modern scholars prefer. Either way, if you're looking for one of the classic Davidic psalms, such as the famous, the Lord is my shepherd, the best place to look is in book one. Book 2 also contains several psalms attributed to David, but in this section there is a very notable difference. If you watched part 1 of this series, you'll remember that two of the sources of the Torah are known as J and E. I didn't mention it at the time, but the reason for this is that each source uses a different name for God. The J source uses the personal four-letter name that we Jews never pronounce, whereas the E source uses the more general term, Elohim. The reason why I didn't mention it in episode one is because these days scholars actually place far less importance on this distinction than they did in the past. However, I bring it up now as a way to point out the major shift that occurs at the start of book two in the Psalms. Whereas book one mostly uses the four-letter personal name for God, book two mostly uses the word Elohim. This probably indicates that each collection came from a different place and or time. Book two is also where we find most of the Psalms that are attributed to the sons of Korah. Korah, who is known as Karun in the Quran, was the cousin of Moses, who rebelled against him. However, his descendants went on to serve in the temple as Levites, and one of their duties was singing songs. Book 3 is where we find the 12 psalms attributed to Asaph, which probably means that they were written by a group of Levites known as the Asaphites, who, like the Korahites and Ezraites, were responsible for singing in the temple. Near the end of book 3, after the last Asaph psalm, the name used for God switches back to the four-letter name, which is then used for the remainder of book 3, as well as for books 4 and 5. Books 4 and 5 are where we find the majority of the anonymous psalms. In episode 2, I introduced this timeline, which I used to tentatively date 
the four sources of the Torah, as well as the various prophets. I am now going to take away the minor prophets to make some room for the books in this episode. So, because the Book of Psalms is a collection of 150 different compositions, it's impossible to place it at a single location. Most scholars believe that some were definitely written before the exile, and some were definitely written after. I'm therefore going to indicate it as a range, like so. Before I move on, I should point out that the Book of Psalms is thought to be related to a now-lost book that Muslims call the Zabur. According to the Quran, Allah revealed several books to various prophets over the centuries, prior to the one received by Muhammad. One of these was called the Zabur, and is said to have been revealed to David. For this reason, the Zabur is usually associated with the Psalms. But according to Muslims, the book of Psalms that exists today is a corrupted version of the original book of Zabur. Muslims believe something similar about the Torah. They believe that God gave the Torah, or Torah, to Moses, but that the version we have today is not the original. I received several comments on episode 1 stating that the four source theory is evidence that the original Torah was corrupted. Well, I suppose that is one way to look at things, but please keep in mind that there is currently no evidence from either archaeology or linguistic analysis to indicate the existence of much older versions of the Torah and Psalms, which then became corrupted or lost. The idea is entirely theoretical and must be accepted based solely on faith, not on historical evidence. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that it's always wrong to believe something based on faith. I'm just saying that it's important to know the difference between which of your beliefs are based solely on faith and which are based on verifiable history. Okay, next up is the book of Proverbs. It too is not really a single book, but rather a collection of texts written by different people during different time periods. Basically, it can be divided into six sections. Although the book begins with the phrase, The Proverbs of Solomon, Son of David, most scholars believe that the first nine chapters are actually a prologue, probably added during the Persian period. This initial section consists of 15 separate poems dealing with specific topics. The word proverb refers to a short, wise saying and therefore the Proverbs section of the book doesn't actually start until chapter 10. That's where we start getting the one-liner bits of wisdom. This section goes until chapter 22, verse 17, and likely represents the original core of the book, perhaps written by Solomon himself, or perhaps attributed to Solomon as a means of establishing authority. Either way, sections 3 and 4 are not associated with Solomon. Section 3 begins with the phrase, Listen to the words of the sages, and goes on to tell 30 wise sayings. And section 4 begins with, These are also by the sages, and includes 5 more. The interesting thing about section 3 is that a good portion of it seems to correspond directly with a work of ancient Egyptian literature known as the Instruction of Amen M. Opet, which dates to around 1000 BCE. So it seems that the ancient Israelites recognized this Egyptian work as being important and decided to incorporate it alongside the words of their own people. Moving on, section 5 starts with, These are more Proverbs of Solomon, compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So these are perhaps later editions, attributed to Solomon, but written during the reign of King Hezekiah. Finally, in section 6, we get three final poems. One by Agur, son of Jake, from Massa. One written by Lemuel, the king of Massa, and the final one being anonymous. As to whether the kingdom of Massa was a real place or a fictional creation, no one is really sure. So, like Psalms, 
Because Proverbs is a collection of several different sayings and poems by several different authors, it's impossible to place it at just one location on the timeline. I'm therefore going to indicate it as a range as well. All right, let's now look at the book of Job, which addresses the age-old question, if a good God exists, why then do horrible things so often happen to good people? Unlike most characters in the Hebrew Bible, Job does not fit anywhere on the biblical family tree. His story is set outside of the land of Israel, sometime during the age of the patriarchs. As to when the story was written and by whom, that is also unclear. What we do know is that the book is written in a very strange form of Hebrew and uses certain vocabulary words that don't show up in any part of the Tanakh. Nowadays, the leading theory is that it was likely written during the Persian period by someone who spoke Aramaic as a first language and only knew a very old, formal version of Hebrew, kind of like a German person today writing something in the style of Shakespearean English. The next five books are grouped together, at least in Jewish tradition. In Christian tradition, their placement is quite a bit different. The reason why Jews place these five together is because A. They are all relatively quite short. B. They are all late additions to the Hebrew Bible and are thus all highly literary in nature, as opposed to being more historical or theological. And C. Each of these five books is associated with a particular Jewish holiday. Song of Solomon with Passover, Ruth with Shavuot, Lamentations with Tisha B'Av, Ecclesiastes with Sukkot, and Esther with Purim. Let's start with the Song of Solomon, the only book in the Bible that could be described as being erotic poetry. As the name suggests, it is associated with King Solomon, but very few scholars today would say that Solomon was the actual author. As is often the case, the date of composition can be narrowed down by studying the vocabulary and grammar used in the text. In this case, like in Job, it seems to be heavily influenced by Aramaic. Aramaic was the lingua franca of the Persian Empire, and throughout the Persian period, it slowly replaced Hebrew as the main language in Judea. However, the Song of Solomon also shares certain similarities to love poetry written by the Greeks and is thus the first book I've mentioned so far that can probably be placed during the Greek period. As to what the name of the author was, sadly we cannot say. It was common at the time to put a famous person's name at the beginning, in this case Solomon's, rather than one's own. Next up is Ruth. In the Christian Bible, Ruth is placed after the book of Judges because chronologically, this is where the story fits. But as with most of the books in the Ketuvim, the book of Ruth was written many hundreds of years after the time period in which it was set. A good analogy would be the historical fiction that is written today. Imagine that someone 2,000 years from now found a novel written in the 21st century, but set during the medieval period. They might initially assume that the author was living during medieval times, but the more they studied the text and other texts, they'd realize that the author actually lived much later and was simply writing about an earlier time. In the case of Ruth, we once again can't name an exact author, but from the context, we can take a guess that it was probably written during the Persian period. This is because the topic matter concerns the marriage of an Israelite man to a non-Israelite woman, something that was an important matter of debate during the Persian period. Next is lamentations, which comes from the word lament, meaning an expression of grief. In this case, the grief is over the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. This allows us to date the book to sometime around this event. Traditionally, the author is said to have been the prophet Jeremiah, which is why Lamentations is placed directly after Jeremiah in Christian Bibles. However, it's possible that the book was actually written by five different authors. This is because the book is comprised of five separate poems, 
each taking up one chapter and each being written in a very different style. They do all have one common feature, though. They are structured on the Hebrew alphabet. The first four are all acrostics, meaning that each line starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The fifth poem is not an acrostic, but it does have 22 lines, corresponding to the exact number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. We now come to Ecclesiastes, known in Hebrew as Kohelet, meaning something like a chairperson who presides over an assembly or meeting. Traditionally, the author is said to have been King Solomon, but again, the language used points to a much later date. Like Ruth, it was probably written by an anonymous author during the Persian period. Ecclesiastes is a strangely pessimistic, brooding sort of book, but one that has inspired authors and poets for centuries, including the likes of Shakespeare, Tolstoy, and Hemingway. It's a good example of how the Bible has had such a strong influence on Western culture that even those who know nothing about the Bible are familiar with phrases that come directly from it. For example, the phrases, eat, drink, and be merry, or there is nothing new under the sun, or this song. All of these lines come directly from the book of Ecclesiastes. Okay, the final book in this set of five is Esther, the only book in the entire Bible that does not mention God, not even once. It's also the only book in the Hebrew Bible that was not found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, which indicates that it was probably one of the last books to be included in the Jewish canon. For Jews, the story is quite clearly meant to be a comedy, from its over-the-top characters to the almost slapstick situations they find themselves in. It's quite clear that the whole thing was designed to be more of a fictional play than a historical account. The overall mood can be sensed in the way that Jews celebrate the festival of Purim today. Unlike most Jewish holidays, which tend to be more serious, Purim is a party day associated with dressing up in costumes and, well, drinking large amounts of alcohol. The story of Esther is set during the Persian period, so obviously it couldn't have been written before that. The assumption is that it was probably written during the early Greek period, in which the good old Persian days provided a good setting for a funny story. Finally, remember the Mesopotamian gods family tree that we covered on this channel two weeks ago? On that tree, there are two characters named Ishtar and Marduk, names that are eerily similar to Esther and Mordecai, the two main characters in the Book of Esther. It is likely that the Esther and Mordecai story was loosely based on much earlier Ishtar and Marduk stories, which would have been very common in Babylonian culture. Which brings me to an important point. As we've seen, much of the content in the Hebrew Bible is based off material taken from other nearby cultures. For example, the creation and flood accounts are quite clearly based on Sumerian myths. And, as we've seen, some of the Book of Proverbs is taken directly from older Egyptian texts. But does this mean that the ancient Israelites were just copycats and that we should ignore their writings and go straight to the older material instead? No, of course not. Often, whenever one artist or writer is inspired by the work of another artist or writer, they'll create something that is similar to the work that inspired them but they will also put their own unique spin on it. This is certainly true of the ancient Israelites. Sure, they often reused the mythological stories and literary tropes that were common during their day, but they also always changed things in small but important ways in order to make points that supported their own unique worldview.
You see, it's always important to keep in mind that the original purpose of the Bible was not to simply record literal history or to make scientific statements in the way that we would today. Rather, it was to share ideas about God and about the purpose of life, things that can't always be expressed in straightforward ways. I've received a lot of comments so far that go something like this. If you don't believe that characters like Abraham and Moses were historical, why then did you convert to Judaism? Well, my response is this. It doesn't matter to me who wrote the books of the Bible or when. Likewise, it doesn't matter to me whether the stories are strictly historical or mostly fictional. The point is, somebody at some point wrote them. And from a literary point of view and my own personal point of view, those books contain some very interesting ideas about God and about the purpose of life. Okay, we've got a few more books to cover. I'm not going to say much about Daniel in this episode because I've decided to do an entire episode on Daniel together with Revelation at the end of this series. For now, I'll just put it on the timeline as being written very late in the Greek period. I'll be explaining why I put it there in that future episode. That leaves Ezra, Nehemiah, 1 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles, which in the original version of the Jewish Tanakh were just two books, a combined Ezra-Nehemiah and a combined Book of Chronicles. The interesting thing about these four books is that they were likely written by a single author, or at least by a single school of authors, who edited them in a way so that the end result was a unified story that covered everything from Adam to the rebuilding of the temple. This is why much of the material in Chronicles is the same as the material in Samuel and Kings. It's basically a second account of the same narrative from a different author. Traditionally, that author is said to have been Ezra, and it's also thought that Ezra was the person who put together the final version of the Torah. Unlike in most of the cases we've looked at, there is less reason in this case to doubt the traditional view. This is because the character of Ezra fits firmly within a historical setting rather than a literary one. Okay, so that concludes our look at the Jewish Tanakh, aka the Old Testament. In the next episode, I'll be tackling the books that Protestants call the Apocrypha and that Catholics call the Deuterocanonicals, as well as a few other books that didn't make it into most Bibles. After that, I'll be delving into the New Testament. If you want to see the full schedule, you can find it in the description, along with several book recommendations for further reading. Thanks for watching. <laughs>